Check it out now, y'all. Nano Hub U online instruction. Okay. Well, we're at the end of week two already. Now we have spent a considerable amount of time on MOS electrostatics. You know, when people study nanoscale devices, especially nanoscale MOSFETs, a lot of times what they're most interested in are things like ballistic transport and quantum transport. We'll, ha we'll be saying quite a lot about ballistic transport and we'll say a little bit about quantum transport. But the thing to keep in mind is that the design of the transistor, the most important thing is its electrostatic design. And that's why we've spent some time getting comfortable with MOS electrostatics. So now it's time to pull this back, return to our virtual model of the transistor, which we're making better and better as we, our, I'm sorry, our virtual source model of the transistor. And we're trying to make it better and better as the course goes on. So we can update it. So just one more time to remind you, we call it a virtual source model because at the top of the barrier, we can maintain the electron density if at this value given by ideal 1D MOS electrostatics. So that's a virtual source of electrons. We maintain a constant density of electrons there. And in a well-designed MOSFET, that's mostly controlled by the gate and very weakly by the drain. So we have this simple expression from 1D MOS electrostatics that applies at the top of the barrier, not always, only when we've designed a good transistor. Now, back in week one, we developed a simple two-piece model for the MOSFET. In the linear regime, we had a simple expression for the linear current. In the saturated regime, we had a simple expression for the saturated current. And the two intersect at a critical voltage we call VD sat, and we had a simple expression for that. So that's something that we, we saw that that was relatively easy to develop. Now we have a little more appreciation as to how the drain voltage affects the threshold voltage and uh, subthreshold as well as above threshold. So remember, current is charge times velocity. We have been spending a lot of time talking about charge, so we understand that reasonably thoroughly now. The average velocity is mobility times electric field for low drain voltage. And in this velocity saturation model, the traditional MOSFET model that we're going to extend, but in that traditional model, the high field velocity or the high drain voltage velocity is just the saturated velocity of electrons. And in the empirical virtual source model, we have an empirical function that takes us from smoothly from the low drain voltage velocity to the high drain voltage velocity. So this is a summary of the equations that we developed, our expression for the current, our expressions for the charge, our expressions for this average velocity in terms of this empirical function, and the critical VD set. And what's nice about this model is that we just have a few, about five, simple, physically easy to understand parameters that fit into this model. So this model gives the drain current in terms of the voltages that we apply to the intrinsic terminals of the device. But you'll recall that we apply voltages to the actual contacts. And between the contacts and the silicon, and between the silicon source and drain and the actual channel itself, there can be some series resistances. So we'll have a drain and a source resistance. There'll be one in the gate too, but I'm not showing it because under DC conditions, there's no voltage drop there, so there's no effect there. So the actual voltages that get into the device are related to the intrinsic voltages, or I'm sorry, the intrinsic voltages that get into the device are related to the actual voltages that we apply from some simple circuit analysis. So these are two equations and two unknowns. You know, the two unknowns are the intrinsic voltages between the drain and the source and between the gate and the source. We have an expression for the current in terms of the intrinsic voltages. So we can solve these two equations in two unknowns for the intrinsic voltages. Given the intrinsic voltages, we plug it in our expressions for the current, and we have the current through the device. So that's something we have to do numerically, but it's relatively straightforward. Okay, now we've talked now about, or recently in the last few lectures, about the subthreshold threshold 
electron density and how it's related to the gate voltage. So now we should be able to treat the subthreshold characteristics. And we've also talked in a little more detail about the above threshold characteristics and seen that the capacitance here is the inversion gate capacitance, which is a little bit less than the oxide capacitance. So we've developed an understanding of these considerations. Now, in an actual device, we want to be able to treat both subthreshold and above threshold and do it in a smooth and continuous way. So we'll need to discuss that in a minute or two, but first let, let's take a little aside and discuss this subthreshold current in a little more detail because this is very important. So our IV characteristics, our transfer characteristics will look like this. You know, one of the key parameters that we have in a MOSFET is its subthreshold swing. And this is directly related to this exponential dependence of the, of the subthreshold current on the gate voltage. So since the charge in subthreshold conditions goes exponentially with gate voltage, the current will go exponentially with gate voltage. When I apply zero volts, I'll still get a finite current. That's what we've called our off current or our leakage current. And above threshold, the uh, current will go linearly with gate volt or with threshold voltage, while below threshold it goes exponentially with threshold voltage. So let's see if we can calculate this subthreshold swing. It's actually quite easy to do. In subthreshold conditions, the current is exponentially related to the gate voltage. If I take the log of the drain current, I'll get the uh, I'll take the log of that exponent. I'll get a VGS over mKT over Q minus a constant involving those threshold voltages. Normally when we plot these characteristics, we plot them on common log paper, log base 10, not log of E. So log base 10 is just log of E divided by 2.3. So when we do the plot, and we plot, take the common log of the drain current, we would get this expression between the log of the drain current and the gate to source voltage. Now if I take the slope the derivative of the log of the drain current with respect to the gate to source voltage, I get a simple expression. This would give me the number of decades of increase in drain voltage we get for an increase in gate to source voltage. But when we say subthreshold swing, what we really mean is one over that slope. We mean the number of millivolts of increase in gate voltage that it takes to increase the drain current by a factor of 10. So that's simply one over this slope that we computed, and it turns out to be 2.3 times this parameter m, which was this capacitor voltage divider ratio that's always a little bit bigger than one unless we have a double gate uh, fully depleted structure. So 2.3 m times kT over Q. We have a nice simple expression for the subthreshold swing. Rem remember that the parameter m is always greater than one. Typically, it's something like 1.1 to 1.4, which means that S is always greater than 2.3 times 0.026, which is 60 millivolts per decade. It might be 70, 80, 90, hopefully less than 100 in a good transistor. Now, let me just stop for a minute and uh, discuss briefly why is it important to have a small subthreshold swing. So what we'll typically have is a transfer characteristic that will look like this say with some subthreshold swing S. So there's a leakage current. Now normally when the device is off, the leakage current corresponds to standby power. And as we put billions and billions of transistors on a chip, we get more and more standby power. There is some maximum leakage current that we can tolerate, and a designer will specify that to you. It might be, it might be one microamp per uh, micrometer of off current. Um, so let's say that we had a subthreshold swing that was even smaller. We could design a device to have the same acceptable off current, but now we could reach the required on current at a significantly lower voltage. You know, why is that important? Well, it's because the power in the circuit goes as voltage squared. So if I could reduce the voltage significantly, I'll reduce the power even more significantly. And that's why there is a lot of attention being paid to reducing the subthreshold slope as far as possible, making the off 
to on transition just as steep as it's possible to do. Now we might ask physically, you know, why is 60 the best that you can do? And it just comes from the physics of the MOSFET. The current comes from carriers being thermally emitted over the energy barrier between the channel and the source. Any emission of particles over a barrier goes as e to the minus barrier height over kT. And it's that exponential relation to the barrier height that leads to the 60 millivolt per decade fundamental limit. So there's a lot of very interesting and creative research going on right now about looking for transistors that operate on fundamentally different physics, not barrier controlled devices per se, but that operate on physics that will allow us to beat this 60 millivolt per decade limit and make the on-off characteristic uh, even sharper. Okay. Now, I should, should just point out that a technology designer deals with a trade-off between off-current and on-current. So notice the off-current is proportional to e to the minus threshold voltage over mkt. So if I want a lower off-current, I increase the vt. The on-current is linearly dependent on v gate to source minus the threshold voltage. So if I want a higher on-current, I reduce the vt. So that's the fundamental trade-off. We'd like a low off-current and a high on-current, and that requires two different things. So we need to make a trade-off. In fact, because one has an exponential characteristic and one has a linear characteristic, it's the log of the off-current that's proportional to the on-current. And technology designers will take a technology and they will plot from that technology. It may produce transistors of different threshold voltages. At each particular threshold voltage, you'll get an on current and you'll get a corresponding off current. You can see that the on currents are increasing linearly, the off currents are increasing exponentially. So a designer will have to make a trade off. How much on current do I need? How much off current can I tolerate? And that characteristic comes from the fundamental physics of the MOSFET, this in thermal injection over a barrier. So. So let me just pose a question that I'm not going to answer, but I'll encourage you to think about. If a MOSFET is a barrier control device and current goes exponentially as e to the minus barrier height over kT, then why is it exponential only under threshold? Why is it linear above threshold? Does anything change fundamentally? You know, the answer is no, but I'll encourage you to think about that. And uh, if you come up with a solution to that, let me know and we'll discuss it a little more. It, it turns out to have a Simple solution, it's related to MOS electrostatics. All right, but let's get on with the rest of this lecture. And we want to return to the question of how do we develop a continuous expression for the inversion layer or electron charge in the channel as a function of gate voltage for our virtual source model. Well, here's one way to do this. And this comes from a paper several years back. This is an empirical expression and we can show that it does the right thing in the two limits. So let's look at this expression. And let's look at it way below threshold. And let's say, remember that logarithm of 1 plus x is approximately x when the argument is small. If I do that, we get an expression that has the electron charge going exponentially with gate voltage, which is just exactly what it should do. If I compare that to the correct answer, it's not quite correct. We get an m here instead of an m minus 1, but it's close. The important point is that it got the exponential dependence properly. The pre-exponential factor isn't quite right, but in practice that would be a small effect that we can tweak some parameters and deal with. Now, if we look above threshold, then logarithm 1 plus x, we can ignore the 1. We'll take the logarithm of the exponential. We just bring down Vg minus Vt, and we get inversion level charge is proportional to Vg minus Vt. And that's exactly the right expression. So this is an empirical expression that has the right behavior in the two limits. Now in the virtual source model itself, and I'll refer you to the paper for more discussion of this, they use a slightly more sophisticated model. And the more sophisticated model has a couple of other parameters that need to be input, and alpha that needs to be input. What this is all about is the fact that, um, well, 
Let me first of all point out that the threshold voltage here actually depends on drain voltage, but that's through Dibble that we understand well. But this second, this additional term that we put in, this has to do with the fact that when you bend the bands to 2 psi b, the band bending doesn't stop completely. It's still possible to bend the bands a little more, just it's just hard to bend the bands beyond 2 psi b. And this leads to the fact that we really need two different threshold voltages, one to describe the inversion level, the uh, sub-threshold characteristic, and a different one to describe the above-threshold characteristic. They're just a little bit different. I'll refer you to this paper for more of a discussion about that. But it just adds a one additional refinement to this empirical model. So the result of that is that we have a continuous model that goes from sub-threshold to above-threshold. What about this output resistance? That is not yet in our model. Why is there some finite output slope to a transistor? Where does that come in our virtual source model? We haven't discussed it yet. Well, it's actually quite easy. Our expression says that the current should be independent of drain voltage, but we know that because of Dibble, the threshold voltage depends on the drain voltage, and once we include Dibble above threshold, we'll be able to accurately treat the output characteristic of these devices as well. Okay, so you know, with these extensions, being able to do sub-threshold conduction, finite output resistance, treating series resistances, we get a very good model of modern day transistors. Uh, now, some of the physics in this model is not sound at this nanometer scale. We have to think of the saturation velocity as some kind of empirical parameter. And we have to think of the effect of mobility as some kind of empirical parameter that makes sense for long channel devices, but that don't make good physical sense for you know, channel, uh, channel lengths in the nanometer, in tens of nanometer or even hundreds of nanometer regime. The point of the course next week when we dive into this is that we can attach physical significance to these parameters if we think about transport in the right way. Okay. But this virtual source model does an extremely good job of fitting not only silicon MOSFETs, but 3.5 transistors and a wide variety of different kinds of devices. So it seems to capture the essential physics. And remember, the essential physics is manipulating energy barriers with gate voltages. Okay, so that wraps up week two for us. Um, let me just mention to you what our goals are for week three. We spent a considerable amount of time, in fact, we've devoted week two to understanding MOS electrostatics because of its importance for transistors. Now it's time to shift our attention to transport and talk about transport in very small devices, ballistic transport and quasi-ballistic transport. So we're going to want to understand transport all the way from the ballistic regime to the diffusive regime. We will then first develop a mathematical theory of the ballistic MOSFET. That turns out to be easy to do. And then we'll compare to the traditional MOSFET theory and we'll see that we've left out something. We'll see that it's important that we're not operating completely in the ballistic limit, but that we will have to consider scattering and quasi-ballistic transport as well. And that will be the subject of week four. So good luck. I'll look forward to continuing this discussion uh, as we begin talking about ballistic transport in week three.